Our scripture reading today is from Matthew chapter 11, verses 2 through 15. And you may find this on page 887 in your Pew Bible. Please join me in prayer. Prepare our hearts, O God, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but our own, that hearing, we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. When John heard in prison that the Messiah was, what the Messiah was doing, he sent word by his disciples and said to him, Are you the one who is to come, or are we to wait for another? Jesus answered them, Go and tell John what you hear and see. The blind receive their sight, the lame walk, the lepers are cleansed, the deaf hear, and the dead are raised, and the poor have good news brought to them. And blessed is anyone who takes no offense at me. As they went away, Jesus began to speak to the crowds about John. What then did you go out into the wilderness to look at? A reed shaken by the wind? What then did you go out to see? Someone dressed in soft robes? Look, those who dress in small robes, soft robes, are in royal palaces. What then did you go out to see? A prophet? Yes, I tell you, and more than a prophet. This is the one about whom it is written, See, I am sending my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way before you. Truly I tell you, among those born of women, no one has arisen greater than John the Baptist. Yet, the least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than he. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of heaven has suffered violence, and the violence take it by force. For all the prophets and the law prophesied until John came, and if you are willing to accept it, he is Elijah who is to come. Let anyone with ears listen. The grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of our God shall stand forever. <clears throat> so I don't know what you really think about John the Baptist. This bug-eating wilderness baptizer seems like a strange conversation partner when we are lighting Advent candles and singing of angels we've heard on high. He seems so certain of himself. I suppose that's just the way it is with prophets. I don't know what you think of him, but Jesus loved him. Jesus said, no one is greater than John, no prophet greater than John, not Moses, not Jeremiah, not Elijah. That's high praise. John was the wilderness man that everyone went out to hear. John said, unless you are basing your life on the things that matter, you're missing the point of your life. And then he reminded us what matters. He had a charisma about him. He just drew you in. It wasn't that he told folks what they wanted to hear. It wasn't that at all, actually. He said he told them the truth. That's what people loved about him. You know, there is within us actually a hunger for truth. He was a great man, the kind of man you'd want to know. But there was another side to John, and this other side was anxious and second-guessing and fully acquainted with disappointment. This same, the same truth-telling that drew folks from far and near also threatened folks. Sometimes they were the same, but he threatened those folks and that part of us that wants to baptize the status quo. Now, you know this about prophets. The gifts that the prophets have, the gift the prophets have is to see the truth of what's going on among us. 
As Rabbi Abraham Joshua Heschel said, prophets know what they see rather than just seeing what they already know. They see the way things really are. But some folks, a lot of us, we, we see what we already know. We, we have our own story, our own narrative of what is real, and we prefer the story to the truth. Herod was one of those storytellers. And so John made him nervous. John made him anxious, and so Herod did what power does. Herod put John in jail. Now, being thrown in the clink was not on John's bucket list. It actually, as a prophet of God, it caught him quite off guard because, you see, John expected that Jesus would come with the kind of power that would put on the run a small soft robe wearing man like Herod. But instead, Herod reigns and the baptizer is behind bars. And John's struggling to make sense of this. The crisis is not just that Herod reigns. The crisis is John realizes he's disappointed. He's disappointed in Jesus. Jesus has let him down. So what do you do when God disappoints you? There's a, there's a moment in Ann Tyler's old novel, Saint Maybe. E Ian Bedlow, uh, he, he grew up Presbyterian, but he found himself drawn to the Church of the Second Chance, and they have a summer camp, and he's sending his kids to the camp of the Second Chance. And Ian's father was a little disturbed by this, and he expresses his disapproval this way. He said, you know, when I was 17, I volunteered to be a counselor at my church camp in Western Maryland. That's because I was in love with the girl who taught archery at camp. <laughs> Marie was her name. I can still see her. Every night I prayed and prayed for her to love me back. I said, God, if you will do this one small thing for me, I'll believe forever and ask no other favor of you ever. But Marie preferred the lifeguard. <laughs> he said, after that, God and me, we've just never been that chummy. I suppose we learned pretty early that God can't be trusted with our plans and hopes. Life will disappoint you. John's real disappointment was not with Herod. He expected Herod to be that way. His disappointment with, was with Jesus. He thought Jesus would, would be powerful. And so through his prison bars, he pushed his words. He asked the question that, you know, I bet, I bet almost all of us ask at some time or another. He said, Jesus, are you the one who is to come or shall we wait for another? Jesus, are you really the Messiah of God? Or are you just my cousin? Jesus, was I wrong about you? And Jesus says, go tell John what you see. The eyes of the blind are open, the lame walk, the dead are raised, the poor hear good news. These are words that John would have known by heart. They are words from the old prophet Isaiah. They are images of how Isaiah described the coming of God's promised day. The blind see, the dead are raised, the poor have good news. I think what John was hoping to hear, though, was... Hang in, my friend. I'm going to bust you out of there. Don't you worry. I'm going to break you out of Herod's prison. But he didn't say that. He said, John, I know it's a hard thing. 
It's not going to change. But I want you to look for the promised day of God is coming. And this is, this is where I think this passage gets real for us. You know this from your own life. God will not keep you out of trouble. You know from your own life, faith will not pave a pathway of pleasures. Life will disappoint you. Sometimes your friends will let you down. Sometimes America will disappoint you. Sometimes the church will disappoint you. Sometimes you'll be disappointed in yourself. And sometimes it feels more cosmic than that. It just feels like the world has lost its way and you feel powerless to do anything about it, which is another way of saying sometimes it feels like God has disappointed us. Not even the greatest of prophets, the most faithful of prophets, escapes disappointment in life. Jesus tells John, I'm not breaking you out of there. That's not my way. It's a hard thing, and it's not going to change. But John blind see, the poor have good news. It was old images from Isaiah that said the life of God is coming. And what John learns is that the way of God in Jesus is not to overthrow those who do evil. The way of God in Jesus is not to eliminate those who oppress. The way of God in Jesus is to love even in the broken places, to love even in the loveless places, until our old blind eyes we're open to see ourselves in the world in a new way until the decayed and lifeless parts of our lives are reborn somehow until the hatreds and fears that paralyze us are shaken free and we learn to walk. Jesus shows John that the power of the Messiah is not to destroy everything that is wrong but to love everyone, even when we're wrong. If I understand the text, I think what Jesus is saying is, John, you weren't wrong about me, but you didn't get the whole of me. Well, what you see is real, John, but what you see is also incomplete. Because, John, you're only seeing what's broken. And you need to pay attention to the good. You need to see the good. I, I, I think that's what Jesus is teaching. That we need to learn to see the good in us and in all. We need more of that. Because, you see... This is what disappointment does to us. Disappointment has a power to convince us that we are defined by that disappointment, that, that we are our worst moment, and that others are their worst moment, that the world is defined by its own brokenness. And what Jesus says is the brokenness is real, but it is incomplete. Because the love of God is alive in the world, and there is good, and you need to be attentive to it. Several of you have shared with me that you've seen and enjoyed very much the movie about Mr. Rogers. And one of the one of the things that Fred Rogers frequently said, he said, when trouble comes, look for the helpers. When trouble comes, look for the helpers. This is a spiritual practice, and I think it's one we need to practice these days. Fred Rogers, you may know this, Fred Rogers graduated from Pittsburgh Theological Seminary as a Presbyterian minister. 
Another graduate of Pittsburgh Theological Seminary as a Presbyterian minister was Dr. Bob Manili. They went to the same school. Manili was the founding pastor of this church. I, I called him on Wednesday and I said, happy anniversary. And he said, what an anniversary? I said, 25 years ago today you retired. I, I thought he was gonna be happier with that greeting than he was. But he stayed on the phone and we talked and we had some of the same conversation we have every time. He asked about you and I told him you were doing well and he, he uh, told me to be good to my wife. He tells me that every time he sees me, good to your wife. And, and then as we hung up, he said, be of good cheer. If you know him, you've heard him say it. Be of good cheer. He didn't make it up. It comes from the Gospel of John, chapter 16, verse 33. It says, be of good cheer, for I have conquered the world. And what I love about that verse is the word that is translated good cheer, the Greek word is tharseo. And tharseo can be translated good cheer, or it can be translated take courage. Good cheer take courage same word and i love that because i think what the ancient greeks knew is that sometimes to be of cheer in this world is an act of courage to sometimes to be of good cheer takes courage I think that's what Jesus is teaching John in this moment. I think he's saying, take courage, my friend. Be of good cheer. For even in this broken and fearful world, the love of God is still alive. And this love will not change every oppressive power. But it will give you courage. And it will give you cheer. Even when you think it might be impossible. You see, it seems to me, see if this resonates with you, disappointment, it has a power to define us, or we let it have a power to define us. Because the disappointments are real, they're just incomplete. And what our faith invites us to do is to look for the good to look for the honorable, to look for the beautiful, to look for those places where love is practiced because there you will see the fingerprints of God and there you will see the inbreaking of God's promised day. I, I was sharing this thought with a friend of mine a couple of months ago. I said, I think we really need to look for the good in everybody. And he, he said, oh, you are such a preacher. He said, <laughs> he said, that is so naive. And I said, you know, I don't think so. I think it's courageous. It's easy to see what's wrong. It's easy to see the flaw in your neighbor. It's easy to see what's wrong in ourselves. But to look for the good, that takes courage. That takes courage and endurance. My friend, Matt, he's... He's in my movable feast study group I've told you about before. Matt's dad battles depression, and when Matt was 16, he said his family, they took his dad to an inpatient psychiatric unit. They locked him in, and as they were going to close the doors, Matt said, I love you, Dad. He said, I said that because I did love my dad, and because I thought if he just remembered how much we loved him, he wouldn't be sad anymore. But he said over time, as he grew older, he learned something about love, that love can't always fix depression because depression's often not a result of a lack of love. It's a 
mix-up of chemicals in the brain. Over time, he learned he couldn't fix his dad because love doesn't have the power to fix everything. He said what love does have is the power to endure. Like the apostle taught us, love believes all things, love hopes all things, love endures all things. I, I think, if I understand the text, I think that's what Jesus tells John. And, and I think it worked. I, I think John found his courage again. I think that old second-guessing, anxious self, while he may not have escaped it completely, at least it no longer defined him. Because John, he never got out of that prison. And that old soft robe-wearing Herod, he killed John, beheaded him. But in the end, John knew that the Messiah had come. And the promised day of God was breaking in. And there is no jail and there is no Herod that can change that. The truth is, you know this. God will not keep you out of trouble. God will not overthrow every evildoer in the world. We're not going to escape every prison. And every day, every day in this world, we see celebrations of moral smallness. We see mean-spirited, demeaning, condescending behavior. We see our neighbors belittle, and the world seems filled with anger and fear, and all of that is true and it's incomplete. But sometimes it's strong enough to almost overwhelm us. It's disappointing. And that disappointment, it has a power. That disappointment wants to teach us that we are the worst in us and everybody else is the worst in them. But Jesus would urge us to look for the good, to look for the beautiful, to look for the honorable. He would urge us to look for the light, to pay attention to those places where love is being practiced because it's there that the Spirit of God is alive and the promised day of God is breaking in. We've got to look for the good. And if, if that feels naive to you today, then just do this. Look at the other people who are looking for the good. Like John the Baptist, who's the kind of man you'd want to know. Like Fred Rogers, who all that time we thought he was teaching the children and he was actually teaching us like Dr. Bob, who even on his worst day said, be of good cheer. Like my young friend Matt, who learned far too early that love endures. And like Stormy Shank, who faced every heartbreak with an irrepressible joy. Like Jackie Boggs, who faced a deteriorating body with a song of praise. Carol Herman, or Julie Lee, or Tony Deal. I could go on, you know. I could keep you here way past lunchtime. If it feels too hard to look for the good, look to those around you who are looking for the good. They are our teachers, as was John the Baptist. He was a man, the greatest of prophets, the kind of man you would want to know. But he was also shaken at times. And it's because he was all of that that we can trust him to be our teacher of courage and good cheer.
Pray with me. Gracious God, we believe. Help our unbelief. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.